Hello, listeners. It's Lawrence Coletti, executive producer of Legal Talk Network. I want to tell you about one of our longest running and most informative shows, The Digital Edge. Each month, our expert hosts, Sharon Nelson and Jim Calloway, talk with renowned authors, speakers, and legal technology gurus about tools, tips, and tricks for running a successful legal practice. If you're seeking a competitive advantage for your firm, make sure to catch The Digital Edge on our website at LegalTalkNetwork.com, in Apple Podcasts, or on your favorite podcasting app. And now, on to the show. Welcome to Thinking Like a Lawyer, with your hosts, Ellie Mistal and Joe Patrice, talking about legal news and pop culture, all while thinking like a lawyer, here on Legal Talk Network. Hello, welcome to another edition of Thinking Like a Lawyer. I'm Joe Patrice from Above the Law. With me, my... My inestim the I inestimable. No, no. Yeah, that's what I was trying to go for. You know, it's you know, it's hot out. I you know, I'm not I, It is so hot that a piece of the Arctic, the Antarctic ice shelf um the size of Delaware actually split off and is now floating around in the ocean. Wow, I hadn't heard that before. Yeah. Well yeah. it's hot now, enough for me to wear shorts at the very least. Anyway, that's Ellie Mistal, who also is at Above the Law, and we're here in ATL headquarters amid the glowing lights and beeps of a high-tech media operation. Well, we're going to discuss the Supreme Court, but first we're going to talk about Ellie being mad, because as we do on every show. Today I'm mad about Rome, yo. So here's the thing. I've been listening to this podcast called The History of Rome. You're the one who actually turned me on to this podcast. I did, yeah. It's by Mike Duncan. It is fantastic. Yeah. Um, and it is about the history of Rome. But let me tell you guys, when I'm listening to it, I don't think that I'm listening to history. I think I'm listening to the future. <laughs> okay. <laughs> A lot of people have made jokes. I've made jokes. Joe, you brought this podcast up to me because I cracked wise about how I will welcome our new Visigoth overlords um, in reference to the Trump administration. Um, and you rightly pointed out that we're not looking at the end of the Roman Empire. We're looking at the fall of the Roman Republic. And this particular podcast, this History of Rome podcast, is so great at really bringing home um, some of the um, late Republican examples um, that seem so important to our current history. So, Joe, my thing uh, now is that Donald Trump is most like Crassus, who was one of the triumvirate um, with Pompey and Caesar mm -hmm. that eventually brought about the end of the Roman Republic. Here's my argument. One, the man's name is Crassus. Donald Trump is what happens when Crass has a baby with stupid, okay? Like, that. that's that's obvious. Donald Trump is obviously crass, right? But Crassus was this very rich man who was not respected by many of his peers and was constantly, desperately trying to get respect and thought that by getting power, he would get respect. Um, he eventually became part of the triumvirate with uh, Pompey and Julius Caesar, who we know a lot about. Um, and Crassus died, interestingly enough, tracing his military glory in... Syria. Yeah, no, no, that's that's good. That's good. Yeah, the, the parallels are interesting and and again, I I mean, I recommended that podcast to you. I listened to it several years ago. It it's very good and and it does, I mean, having been recorded years ago, it actually is kind of scary the parts that cover that era. You listen to and go, yeah, that's yeah, that happens since once that. <laughs> once the institutions are broken, they can't be put back together. And I think that the, again to tie it all together to me with Trump is what we're seeing with Trump isn't just that I, mean, I have a high school friend named him, Alex Bagasy, who kind of stops around Facebook getting angry at people who compare Trump to Julius Caesar. Um, that's an insult to Julius Caesar. Um, and I totally agree with that. Trump is not basically he's basically not skilled enough to on his own bring about the end of the American Republic. But he's certainly able to take large, wet dumps on our institutions. And once those institutions are covered in crap, I don't see how they come back. Well, that's a very cheery view uh, for today. But yeah, no, it's... Let's speak about an institution that hasn't been fully drowned in Trump refuse. Ooh, wow. You know, Boom. Ten, 10 points for that transition. I thought about it on the train. Oh, nice, nice. Okay. <laughs> so uh, that's right. We are going to talk about the Supreme Court today, which is the institution that theoretically hasn't been dumped totally upon. And for that, as regular listeners of the show might expect. We're bringing back our 
our go-to Supreme Court expert, which is uh, Goldstein and Russell partner and SCOTUS blog contributor to Jinder Singh. Welcome back. Hey, guys. Great to be with you. So in preparation for this, I went back and listened to our Supreme Court preview show that we recorded back, you know, oh, low so many months ago. It seems like forever ago. And it was interesting how right and wrong we were. I just wanted to say, like, to go kind of frame this discussion What's our that. scorecard? Our, our scorecard was pretty good. I mean, we did kind of go all in on what Merrick Garland was going to do to the court. So, I mean, that's probably was a mistake. Um, <laughs> but, but beyond that, uh, we kind of focused early on on the idea that Trinity Lutheran was the most interesting thing that was going to end up happening. But more importantly, we all kind of agreed this was going to be a boring Supreme Court season. And uh, Tejinder, you were litigating in it. Was it as boring as it looked like from out here? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's not, it, it depends on exactly where you're sitting. In terms of Supreme Court terms, this was not a blockbuster term. This wasn't the type of term where we were waiting for the big decisions to come out on the last day that we're going to make all the headlines. You know, the court issued 69 opinions. 41 of those cases were decided unanimously. Only seven of them were decided with five vote majorities. Uh, and the trend toward unanimity and, and sort of less controversy is, I think, a product of the fact that the justices, when they had a, you know, a potential 4-4 tie situation on an eight-justice court, just didn't want to take cases that would lock them up that way. And so they steered themselves toward the easy cases, and the easy cases tend to be a little less splashy. Definitely the most exciting court news in the last six months has not been happening at the Supreme Court, but it's been happening in the Ninth Circuit. Um, and to a lesser extent, the uh, extent the the Fourth Circuit. So um, before we kind of fully dive into the term that was, I think we got to start with the the kind of the most famous per curiam uh, decision of the year, um, which is the court probably Roberts partially lifting the injunction against the Donald Trump executive order Muslim slash travel ban. Yeah. Yeah. So that my question is, first of all, from a court watcher perspective, um, do you agree with the the kind of consensus wisdom that that opinion was that decision was mainly written by Roberts um, more than anybody else? Uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that. That would not surprise me at all. The chief justice has taken it upon himself to write some of the opinions in some of the more momentous sort of politically salient cases, you know, the Obamacare case being a, a really good example of that. Um, and so I think that, that that intuition is as good as any. Yeah, for sure. And with that, I, I wonder how much of the hand did Robert show um, with his decision there. So I think the key parts of the lifting of the ban was to really make this connection between uh, this distinction between people with so-called bona fide connections with the United States. Um, just in case you were wondering, those people are, are the injunction against the travel ban still applies to people with bona fide connections. Uh, lifting the ban against the travel ban, so like allowing the travel ban to be uh, prosecuted against people with no bona fide connections. Um, the court not making a distinction as between what a bona fide connection is and what one isn't, kind of leaving it to eventually the State Department to do that, and telling the lawyers specifically um, to be ready to argue the issue of mootness um, when it comes up in October. So kind of with that as, as an overview, what are we thinking for October now? Do we think that mootness could really be the way to get rid of this ban, or do we think that it's gonna, we're going to reach the merits? I think there's a very high probability that this case goes away, and I think that that's for a couple of reasons. The first is that the travel ban was always intended to be an interim measure. Right? The point of the executive order was to freeze the border while the executive branch figured out policies that would make sense to allow people from the listed countries in. And originally, the government was saying things along the lines of, we need 90 days or so, and for some parts of it, 20 days to figure this out. They've now had well in excess of 100 days to figure it out. So there will be a real question come October, uh, you know, what are you doing over there, right? Why do you still need these policies in place? Are these policies actually still intended to be doing any work by their own terms? And so it may well be the case that action will happen inside the executive branch that would make the case go away. And then there are other reasons the case could become moot as well. You know, the, the things could happen for the various challenges 
challengers, their loved ones could get visas and so on. Because right now, all of the challengers in the case, they have folks, I believe, whose relatives do have bona fide connections. Mm -hmm. Now, that may not be true for states like Hawaii. And so we'll have to see exactly how that all shakes out. But there's also there's a decent chance that it could go that way. And so, yeah, my my suspicion is that the court was sending a signal like, you know, you really don't want to bring this up here, guys, <laughs> and giving them, you know, a bit of a, a bit of a warning and seeing what they do. The Trump administration, of course, is so good at reading those subtle, subtle, <laughs> um, those subtle norms that the rest of society tries to impress upon them. Let's go to yeah. Trinity. Yeah. Trinity Lutheran, we in our preview kind of thought that was a very interesting case, given that it was one of those cases that had been kicked over. Uh, it was one of those things where it seemed by the way in which it had come up, we discussed in the fall, by the way it had come up, it seemed as though this was a case that everyone knew was going to be a 4-4 once Scalia was gone and that they didn't necessarily want to deal with and make a 4-4, but then it ended up being on this session and they came to a conclusion and it was it was kind of the interesting case. Uh, some traditional sides were crossed and then it was also Judge Gorsuch, who I'm going to keep calling Judge Gorsuch, I guess. I probably shouldn't. Gorsuch is kind of debut. So what happened in Trinity Lutheran and why was that as important as we uh, as we all surmised it would be? So sure, to just refresh everybody, Trinity Lutheran is the case about whether a church playground, a preschool, can participate in a program to use recycled scrap tires provided by the government to resurface its playground. The state had a policy that it would not extend this program to religious institutions of any kind, and the Supreme Court held that that's unconstitutional, that it burdens the free exercise of religion to discriminate against a church playground playground just because it is a church playground uh, when it would have otherwise qualified for the program. There is a dissent in the case, uh, but it's only a two-justice dissent from Justices Sotomayor and Ginsburg, and they argue that this is the first time ever that a state has effectively been ordered to pay money to a religious institution, and they think a major line has been crossed with respect to the Establishment Clause. Uh, and the reason that this case is a, a really big deal, you know, the facts don't sound that pressing, right? It doesn't sound terribly important whether you can get your hands on recycled scrap rubber for your playground or not. But there are really large questions lurking in here about, for example, school vouchers and whether programs must extend uh, vouchers to include parochial schools, for example. And there are other examples as well of where religious organizations are not eligible to receive public funds uh, that certain secular organizations are. And there's just a huge uh, looming question now of what will become of all of those. Right. But this is where the infamous footnote three comes into play. And I think it's so great um, for one of the reasons why I love covering the court is because you can really have real disagreements handled in a footnote. So for, for those playing along at home, in the decision, the majority opinion was a very slim majority as to footnote three, um, that only uh, Roberts, Alito, Kagan and I want to say Kennedy um, signed on to footnote three. Footnote three was the footnote that basically said, you know what, guys, we're only worried about schools here. Like we're not we're trying to all those looming issues to Ginger just talked about. Um, footnote three was kind of saying, oh, we're not really going to decide. We're not really deciding those looming issues right now. Breyer, um, who wrote a concurrence, also in his writings kind of suggested that hey, guys, we're just talking about schools. We're not talking about vouchers. Don't be freaked out. So am, am I reading that right, or, or am I wish-casting there? Yeah, I mean, the text of footnote three is amazing, and I'll, ju I'll just read it because it's, <laughs> it is really good. So it says, this case involves express discrimination based on religious identity with respect to playground resurfacing. We do not address religious uses of funding or other forms of discrimination. And that's just like a fascinating footnote. And, and the disagreement about the footnote is really fascinating because you don't often see like 
a vociferous disagreement in the Supreme Court about what they have not decided, right? Um, <laughs> but this is one of those cases where, where clearly some percentage of the court wants this decision to stand for a much broader proposition and to put together their majority, you know, they sort of attempted here to narrow it. But the language they use to narrow it is also fascinating, right? Because when you say things like, we do not address other forms of discrimination, like discrimination is a pretty loaded word, mm-hmm. right? And to go out and basically say, you know, there may be other forms of discrimination out there that, although not addressed by this opinion, you know, we think of as discrimination, maybe to send a, a, a pretty clear signal. So I'm sure the language of that footnote was uh, heavily negotiated during the opinion drafting process. Yeah, I mean, that, there was the uh, earlier, the, this, I'm trying to think when I am, was it this week or last week? Uh, there was the Linda Greenhouse article uh, where she she focused on how Gorsuch responds kind of to footnotes, some of the things he said and whether or not that was kind of imprudent of him to question the ways in which the court's internal politics and the internal negotiation happens. Tengender, what did we learn about Gorsuch, our newest justice this term? So Justice Gorsuch wrote five times. He wrote one majority opinion only. It was a unanimous opinion in a case about the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, pretty straightforward statutory interpretation. He wrote also a um, two dissents and two concurrences, and he dissented from one denial and certiorari too, I guess. And so, you know, generally, and every time he wrote, he was in agreement with, there was one other justice at least who came along with him, and it was Justice Thomas. Yep. Um, and so folks who were excited about Justice Gorsuch joining the bench because he would be sort of a, you know, a Scalia 2.0 may be a little bit surprised that he's actually more of a Justice Thomas 2.0. Uh, and that's a very different, very different justice. Uh, I think it suggests... Oh, hell yeah. Uh, it suggests overall that Justice Gorsuch is likely to be more conservative than originally expected. And, you know, his writing this term, I think, has suggested that especially on some of these questions that have really struck at the heart of political controversy, and this includes same-sex marriage, this includes the religion issues in Trinity Lutheran, it includes gun rights, he is quite eager to jump into the fray. People always have suggested, uh, people who don't pay attention, have always suggested that Thomas and Scalia were somehow in lockstep. And that's such a, that's such a poor reading of, of where the court is. One of the things that I like to tell people is, no, 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 Justice Thomas is who you thought Justice Scalia was all this time. <laughs> um, whereas Scalia, <laughs> right? Whereas Scalia had a bit, you know, the, obviously with all the originalism, um, the father of originalism, he understood a reliance interest, right? He understood that you weren't actually starting from scratch. Um, and that, I don't want to say moderate and Scalia in the same breath, but that moderated or mollified some of his opinions in a way that Thomas straight don't care about. And it's, does, it does seem, at least from this first term, um, that Gorsuch is much more in the Thomas vein of originalism than the Scalia vein of originalism. Yeah, I think that's right. And I don't think it's only originalism. I think it's really, you know, when you talk about reliance interests, you're also talking, I think, necessarily about the principle of stare decisis, right? The, how much respect should the Supreme Court give to its own past precedent? Because it's obviously not bound by it. And I think you'll find, you know, you'll find them all over the place. Or Justice Thomas opinion saying, you know, the court decides this case based on past decision X, that's fine as far as it goes, but I would have overruled X. Here's citations to all my dissenting opinions where I said so, and I still would. You know, he really does not <laughs> care that the court has like decided an issue before. And, and Justice Gorsuch appears to be exhibiting at least a little bit of that trend as well, a sense for, well, you know, are we really going to feel ourselves, you know, bound by past mistakes? Uh, I have new ideas and I want to air them out. I'm getting a feeling this is why Justice Gorsuch didn't get his hug from Justice Kennedy at his swearing in. If anyone missed that, there was an awkward moment at his swearing in where he went to hug Kennedy and Kennedy was like, um, yeah, I'm going to pass. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting the feeling this is why our colleague David Latt is wrong. Um, our colleague on Love the Law, David Latt, um, he wrote a very passionate, very well-written 
He's uh, explaining uh, why he thinks that gay marriage is going to be safe even if Kennedy retires. But it was based on the justices having a respect for reliance interests and having a respect for stare decisis that I just don't see. But that's neither here nor there. Um, to Ginger, I want to move on to, to I need your help with uh, Packingham because I find myself agreeing with Samuel Alito, and that doesn't make me happy. That makes me question my own my, my own self. So you should should take two opioids and call me in the morning. You know, that's that's a problem for me and my ancestors. Explain Packingham and, and, and try to help me not agree with Alito here. Sure. So Packingham was ultimately a unanimous decision, all the one where they disagree a bit about about the rationale. And so the basic question in Packingham was, can a state make it illegal, um, that is criminal, for a registered sex offender to access social media networks like Facebook and Twitter that permit minors to create accounts? And uh, the court says, no, you can't do that. That violates the First Amendment. And the reason it violates the First Amendment is because social media is obviously a, a tremendous vehicle for the dissemination of speech and for hearing speech. And so to just blanket suppress membership or the use of these uh, networks it would be to burden way too much speech for the purpose of protecting minors. And so Justice Kennedy kind of opens his opinion, as, as he is sometimes wont to do, with some sort of sweeping pronouncements about the First Amendment and the modern internet. And he basically yes. comes at it through the lens of like, look, you know, the internet is, is really important. The internet is where so much speech happens. We need to think about it basically like the public square of yesteryear and give it all of the robust First Amendment protections, or at least hesitate before we would suspend those protections in the internet context. Uh, Justice Alito wrote an opinion joined by the Chief Justice and Justice Thomas, and he said, look, you know, I think cyberspace is not necessarily the equivalent, the 21st century equivalent of public streets and parks. I think that we need to have some clear understanding of how this all works and to, to be a little more circumspect before we just strip governments of the ability to regulate what happens on the internet, uh, in large part, you know, to protect children, but for other reasons as well. Uh, and so he urged, I guess, a little more caution and I'm actually interested to hear from you the parts of the Alito opinion that sort of resonate with you the most. Well, I mean, that's just the thing. It's the caution for it. It's the thought that the government, while it obviously has a, an important interest in protecting speech, um, and while obviously so many speech acts are now happening in cyberspace, I think it's a bit of a false equivalency to say that every time a person hops on a Facebook or hops on a Twitter, they are immediately given all of the speech protections that you get when you go to the park or go out on the street. I think that the anonymity that the internet allows um, changes, needs to change the calculus a little bit, or at least needs to give the government the option of changing the calculus a little bit. Um, and so I do think that you can. Uh, I mean, I, God, you're, I hate to say this, right? You're like but an anti-internet blogger. This is amazeballs. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 it, I, I'm obviously struggling with with this part of me. But no, I, I worry that if you truly give in to this thought that the internet is just like being on the street, is just like the public message board, um, then the government potentially loses compelling interest in regulating some of the behavior that happens on the internet, which isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world. Joe, don't hit me. I, I mean, I, I was most fascinated by in that whole thing, which I mostly disagreed with. Uh, but, <laughs> but I actually do think there is a discussion to be had about the anonymity factor. That does change what the framers, for instance, when they talked about being able to go out and have an opinion, generally probably thought you're going to go out and have an opinion and people are going to be able to check you. But that said, a lot of famous opinions from that era, like, say, I don't know, the Federalist Papers, were written anonymously. So I think it's, we're kind of drawing a little bit too much of this anonymity argument. I think there probably was anonymity that was in at play back then, too. We just, you know, we've just figured out who all those guys were, so we forget about it. Yeah, I mean, there, I guess that's the thing, though. There is something to be said for, if I write in a newspaper, if I go out on the street, people can figure out who I am 
and shout at me for being an idiot, right? If I do it on the internet, there's nothing that happens. And so it's it's from there that I start to wonder if the if the connection is is 100% accurate the way that Kennedy um, put it or if I kind of agree more with Alito. At least that again, I totally I just like Alito, I totally agree with the decision in this particular case. But maybe slow down a little bit. I'm, I could also just be. I mean, to gender honestly, I've got two kids. I could just be getting old. Just, just damn straight old. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, we'll do our best to stay off your lawn. But I think, you know, the. <laughs> I think that the, you know, your the point you raise is is obviously fascinating, and for court watchers, it's also interesting because watching how the court deals with the intersection of constitutional doctrine, right, that's been in place for a couple centuries versus uh, modern technology, right? It creates really fascinating and often, you know, really tricky conundrums, right? Because the court's tendency is to reason by analogy, right? To say, oh, yeah, you know, this, uh, this is just like a public park, or oh yeah, a GPS tracker is just like a tiny constable who hops in your car. You know, like they there these <laughs> lines have like showed up in different judicial opinions, and they show that how difficult it can be for courts to adapt constitutional thinking to modern technology. And you know, if we only had like a functional legislature, uh, there would be perhaps less of a need for this, because of course a lot of this stuff can be legislated in ways that are sensible. I think North Carolina's law was far too sweeping. But if the law hadn't been so crazy, you know, it's entirely possible that, you know, it's the old adage, right? Bad cases make bad law. And so to the extent you find yourself uncomfortable, it's probably because you saw a predictable judicial reaction to a ham-fisted law. And if there was a little more work going on at the legislative level, I wonder if the judicial reaction would have been more subtle. Yeah, if, if there had just been more nuance to begin with. Because there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way for me to keep a sex offender from tweeting dick pics at my kid. Like, there's just, there's got to be a way to make that stop. There is the block function. Oh, yeah, but my kid doesn't know that. Yeah, fair enough. Well, let's transition to something else real quick. So there was the TAM case, which we also talked about in our preview, uh, because we expected this to function as something of an avatar for the Redskins case, which <laughs> it did. This was the case in which a Asian American rock group had uh, tried to trademark their band name, which also was a slur for Asians. Uh, their argument was they were reclaiming it. The Patent and Trademark Office took the stance that the law that allows them not to grant trademark registry entry for disparaging marks meant that they didn't, you know, couldn't do that. They challenged that. They uh, turned out to succeed, and therefore the Washington Redskins can go ahead and sell everything they want without any repercussions. So I guess my first question about this is, what, Tejinder, you think about this case? What Was this basically how you expected this to come down? Yeah, I mean, there, the interesting question in the case to me was, how do we treat the registration or non-registration of a trademark, right? So if you can't register your trademark, that doesn't mean that the band can't call itself the slants, right? It just means that if some other band shows up and also calls itself that they may have trouble suing or, you know, there may be some issues down the line for brand identification purposes, but no one was saying it's like illegal to name your band this. And so I was really curious how the court was going to deal with the question, whether this is even a form of censorship at all. And the court basically unanimously is like, yeah, it is, you know, you can't just withhold benefits on the basis of, of your, of your viewpoint. Um, and it's like, oh, okay. But then on the flip side, the court it doesn't go all the way. You know, the government's argument was, well, trademark registration is really government speech. It's us saying this is okay uh, in the same way that we approve license plates, right? There was that case about Texas license plates. Um, and the court is like, no, it's not really that at all um, because you're not really paying for the speech or whatever. You know, really, really some sort of fine distinctions there. Um, and so how the court got to where it did with such unanimity is like kind of a... Uh, it's an interesting path, 
the result is, I think, not not terribly shocking at the end of the day, because once you decide that, that this is a form of censorship, it's kind of obvious how arbitrary the disparagement clause has been. Uh, and, you know, there's a Lisa Blatt at Arnold and Porter. Uh, she's a wonderful Supreme Court practitioner, has made a uh, made it her favorite thing in the world to just write briefs which are laundry lists of all the offensive and horrendous, you know, concepts that have been trademarked over the years as sort of an illustration of how arbitrary the enforcement has been. And I think that that point looms kind of large when you talk about censorship. And so, yeah, the result itself is not that surprising. Uh, It's also obviously very good news for the Redskins. But yeah, there are some interesting doctrinal moves along the way. Yeah. And when I was reacting to it, my my thought was, you know, in the first page of uh, the, the opinion, it kind of says, you know, you, you can't take away someone's right of free expression. And I was like, yeah, but that wasn't at all what anybody was trying to do here. And what I really, I took away from it was the lesson here is that the Supreme Court has your back if you care about free speech and if that free speech is how you make money. Uh, <laughs> maybe your ability to have free speech elsewhere, we're not so sure about. But so long as it's a business trying to make money off of its speech, they are, they are right there for you. They will defend you to the death. <laughs> that was just everything I got out of the uh, every page of it was just like, you know, I mean, we're not going to stand in the way of people making cash. Yeah, and it's a it's a parallel theme that the First Amendment has kind of emerged as like a major deregulatory tool, right? Um, in many yeah. areas, campaign finance being an obvious area, but also, um, you know, there's this case, uh, the commercial speech cases, right? Sorrell versus IMS Health was about the collection of certain health data, and you know, there's really lots of areas where the First Amendment has become a deregulatory powerhouse. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Th- it's become one of the tools in the most business-friendly court ever toolbox, right? Yeah. Let's end with uh, people who who <laughs> who got screwed once again by our government. Yeah, um, <laughs> we're talking, of course, about people who were detained post 9/11 and uh, wanted to sue the government for the horrific conditions they were exposed to, and the court said no. <laughs> Dejinder, I did a I did a thing um, with WNYC. Um, with Rachel Mirpole, who argued the case um, for the detainees um, in front of the court, and I, I you know, I, we had this thing maybe a week after the arguments. Um, she was obviously very tired, um, but she was surprisingly hopeful. And I just, I remember her walking away and thinking, like, "There's no effing way this court is going to do the right thing." And I think, uh, of course, the, they didn't. So, kind of walk us through our Ziegler case. Yeah, so the facts are, as you described, after 9-11, there was a policy of detaining you know, Muslim men and men from certain countries who were here illegally, even though, and then the allegation, the complaint is that even though the government knew by a certain time that these men had nothing at all to do with terrorism or suspected terrorism, they continued to be detained unlawfully in really horrific conditions. So they brought an action under a case called Bivens, which is the case that you use when you want to bring a civil rights action against against federal officials. And basically what the court did, and, and you know, the facts of this case are important. Uh, this country's reaction to 9-11 is a major, major issue and a major human rights problem for our country. But what the court does is it really goes even much, much, it's much worse than that. Uh, it basically <laughs> limited Bivens like to its facts. It sort of said, look, if you want to bring a Bivens case, like you have to identify sort of special circumstances for ever extending Bivens, and courts should consider whether there's any good reason not to before they give you a Bivens remedy. And so what winds up happening in this case is that the all but one of the claims of the detainees are basically thrown out because they don't resemble the original Bivens claim. You know, they're based on alleged policy of the executive branch, which Bivens was not, and you know, there are all these other kind of distinctions drawn. And Justice Breyer dissents, and he reads the dissent from the bench, uh, which is, you know, a step justices only take when they feel extremely strongly about this. And the point he makes in dissent, which I think is just dead on correct, is, look, this is a major, major limitation 
on your ability to sue for civil rights violations, and courts should be enforcing the civil rights laws and norms and constitutional norms once a crisis uh, like 9-11 is over. If the government oversteps in its response, like, you know, we should be getting in there and vindicating the rights of people who were wrongly harmed. The majority's response basically is like, ah, we think that's kind of for Congress to figure out. And maybe, you know, the fact that Congress hasn't acted shows that we shouldn't just go around creating judicial remedies, you know, willy-nilly. So there's a lot of debate in the opinions about how broad Bivens was originally. There's a lot of debate about whether Bivens should be extended to novel factual circumstances. The ultimate conclusion is one that I think is very distressing for anybody who uh, is concerned about overzealous law enforcement, is concerned uh, at the federal level, or is concerned about uh, our government adopting policies that are hostile to basic human rights. Uh, it is basically that you have very, very little capacity to get monetary relief. You know, the court does highlight that there may be other remedies, things like suing for an injunction or whatever. Um, but if you are harmed by the government, uh, your chances of being made whole after the fact have just gone way down. Yeah, and my question for that is is almost to accept the premise that the majority puts out there. And, to, and I know this is taking you a little bit far afield, but you know, is congressional relief the only way? Because it, it seems to me that piercing the veil of qualified immunity uh, and, and for those paying along their home, that's, that's how you get money out of the government, right? You have to pierce the veil, you have to remove their qualified immunity, and that way you can hold them accountable for their illegal actions that they take upon you. Um, and if you can't do that, then you can't really do anything. The courts just seem unwilling to do it. They weren't willing to do it in Ziegler. They didn't seem at all ready to do it in uh, Santiago Gonzalez, um, the, the kid, the border shooting kid case. So are we just waiting now for Congress um, to just change the law, to just kind of a sweeping change on the qualified immunity law um, coming from Paul Ryan's Congress? Is like, yeah, good is, luck with that. Is that the only way that this is happening? Yeah, I don't sense that there's a lot of appetite in the federal judiciary for limiting the scope of qualified immunity or for, you know, creating new judicial remedies. I think that the the overwhelming sort of attitude has been a deference to especially law enforcement. And, you know, that's that's in part because many judges themselves are like former prosecutors um, or you know, come from backgrounds where the law enforcement perspective is very, very prominent. And I think that they generally tend to believe that, like, other officials in government are doing the best they can. Uh, and so there isn't that much of a need for these mechanisms. What's really interesting is to watch the parallel development of these two tracks, right? You talk about the declining ability to get damages. And then in parallel with that, there is intense hostility in the court toward application of the exclusionary rule, right, which is your other remedy for um, Fourth Amendment and Fifth Amendment violations is to have evidence against you suppressed. And so we're getting to the point, and a lot of times, the the hostility to the exclusionary rule has been justified on the grounds that, oh, you can just sue for monetary damages instead, right? And wouldn't that be a better remedy than throwing <laughs> out uh, probative evidence? Uh, but now we're watching that second remedy deteriorate as well. And, and I think at some point we may get to the point where something's got to give, where they can't whittle both remedies down to zero without these important provisions of the Constitution basically becoming dead letters. And so, you know, I do expect and hope that there will be some retrenchment on, on some of these, but it's going to take some doing. The moral of the story is that whether it's in this context or any, whatever context it is, closing the doors to the courthouse seems to be a continuing trend in my eyes, right? Is, right. That, is that kind of fair, whether it's for these reasons in the criminal co law enforcement context or, you know, over on the business side it, that with class actions and the work that they're getting into with forced arbitration and so on, that just people shouldn't go to court is kind of a, a theme. <laughs> Yeah, I think that is a really um, a really clear trend in the court's recent cases. You know, there's these cases about personal jurisdiction, cases about class action certification, cases about uh, arbitration, as you know. Uh, there's just again and again, you know, the courthouse door, the steps get a little steeper, the door gets a little heavier, and yeah, the ability to sue, you know, a little less meaningful every single year. 
I guess we're just lucky that Donald Trump can still find his way to the courthouse. <laughs> yeah, but well, more I mean, often got... as a defendant, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I stopped myself before I made another joke. Uh, but so I think that should wrap up. We are super, super glad to have Tijinder here again, because uh, and we probably will in a October. couple of months when we <laughs> need our preview. So. Uh, that's your advance invitation, though you probably should have already expected it. It's already in the mail, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, just tweet it to me with some with some dick pics. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first invitation for dick pics for an LTN podcast, I think. There oh, wait, go. no, I Make think once... No? I think Digital Edge Month, maybe, I don't know. We had Rendats on once, yeah. so I'm not sure. Oh, that's actually true. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks to all of you for listening. Be sure to subscribe at whatever podcast subscribing vehicle vector that you have. Give reviews because those are certainly helpful. And the more you do that, the better our visibility is to other people who might enjoy the podcast. Uh, you don't want to be like Ellie discovering a history podcast like seven years after the fact. You want to like <laughs> find out now, and that's why you want to give us reviews. Hopefully good ones, but you know. Also, you should follow our work on Above the Law. You should follow us on Twitter. I'm at Joseph Patrice. He's at L-E-N-Y-C. Those are all the things I think I need to say. Oh, and uh, the LTN app has all of the various LTN podcasts. Great. Learn to swim. Antarctica is coming. There we go. All right. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. You can also find us at AboveTheLaw.com, ATLRedline.com, iTunes, RSS, Twitter, and Facebook. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.